So last time we derived wave equations for the acoustic wave, both in terms of the pressure and the displacement. Now what we want to look at is we want to look at wave power. Now we've already done this for the wave on a string and we came up with an expression that was always positive because we've always got a positive power transmission for a wave. Now an acoustic wave is a little bit different. It's no longer constrained like the waves on this wave machine to travel in a single line. It can spread out as it moves because it's a three-dimensional wave. So this is going to alter the expression we get for the wave power and we're going to have to define a new quantity called wave intensity. So to see how to do that, let's look in detail at our wave equations. Now what we want to do is we want to look at the power of an acoustic wave. So what I've got is I've got my pressure deviation now. We've got a wave coming in this way and just as we did for a wave on a string, this pressure deviation here relative to the normal pressure of the fluid is going to move, cause this fluid element here to move. And so this force is going to generate a force and that force is going to have a power because we know the power of the force is the dot product of the force vector with the velocity vector. So what we want to do is we want to calculate this power and we're going to call the power R to avoid any confusion with pressure. So this force is just going to be this pressure deviation multiplied by the area of this face of the fluid element. And so that's going to be little p times delta y delta z. So this is our force here. And then our velocity is simply the rate of change of displacement with respect to time for our given position. So this is a partial derivative, remembering, because we've got two variables here. So it's the rate of change of position with respect to time um, for a rate of change of displacement with respect to time for our given position. So if I look at this, I can also use the equation that we derived uh, before to relate the pressure deviation to the displacement of the fluid, and I'm going to substitute that into here. So our power now is going to be equal to, well in this case I'm going to have minus b, and then I've got partial phi by partial x times delta y delta z partial phi by partial t. So if I tidy that up a little, I'm going to have that the power here is minus b times delta y delta z uh, partial phi by partial x times partial phi by partial t. So this is very similar to the initial expression we got for the power of a wave on a string where we've got this multiple of two partial differentials. So now we need to do is we need to evaluate these. So here's the expression we have for the power of the acoustic wave. And what we're going to do is we're going to use our uh, displacement um, of the fluid to um, substitute in these values for the partial differentials. So we start with our solution to the wave equation written in trig form here. We differentiate it with respect to time, and we're going to get a factor of omega. We get a minus sign from going from cosine to sine, and we get another minus sign here, so we end up with plus. Uh, when we differentiate it with respect to x, keeping t constant, we get a factor of k here and we left with the minus sign from going from cosine to sine. So if we substitute these into the power, um, then what we have is we have minus b delta y delta z um, and then we've got um, times omega a sine of kx minus omega t times minus k a sine of kx minus omega t. So if we combine these together, what we're going to be left with, well, the minus signs are going to cancel with each other. We're left with a k, an omega, uh, sorry, b, an omega, a k, and then an a squared. So we're going to have b omega um, k a squared times now sine squared kx minus omega t. So this is, oh, and we've got our delta y and delta z. So this is, first, a good sign. We've got a positive definite value. Sine squared varies between 0 to 1. Um, and we have uh, all of these quantities are going to be positive. And so if we want to write the uh, mean power here, then we can write that as a half b omega k a squared times delta y delta z, because the average of this is a half. 
right? So the average of sine squared uh, is going to be a half. So this is our mean power. But here's the problem. We've got this delta y times delta z, and these are not defined. This is the size of our element of the fluid. So this is an area, and it's the area perpendicular to the direction of motion of the wave. So if we have the wave going this way, what it is is it's the area um, that is perpendicular to this direction of motion of the wave. So what we're going to define is we're going to define a new quantity called the wave intensity. And the intensity of the wave, I, so this is the intensity um, I, is equal to the power per unit area. So in that case, what we have is since this is the area here, then this means that the intensity, I, for a acoustic wave is a half B omega K A squared. And I should say that this is the mean intensity uh, for an acoustic wave. Now the units for this, since we have, uh, we've got a power and we've got an area here, well that's watts for the power and it's meter squared per area, and so this gives us watts per meter squared as the wave intensity. So if we now look at a point source of acoustic waves, and they're radiating out in all directions, so the waves are coming out here uniformly in all directions, and this point source has a power r, right? So we've got a power for this point source that's equal to r. Then if we look at the waves a distance r away from this point source, the total area of this sphere is going to be 4 pi r squared. So we're looking at the surface now of this sphere surrounding this point source in the middle. So what that means is, is that because we've got perfect symmetry, by uh, a symmetry we have the, the intensity is uh, a constant on this surface. So we have no variation of the intensity over this surface because otherwise we'd break the symmetry of the system. So using the symmetry argument, the total power of the waves passing through this surface here is just going to be the intensity, which is the power per unit area, multiplied by the area, and that will give us the total power. So if we look at this intensity here, then we've got i times, and then this is 4 pi r squared, is equal to the total power. Well, all of these waves, since the waves are all traveling with the same phase velocity c, all of these waves will have been emitted from the point source at exactly the same time. So the total power of these waves, by conservation of energy, must be equal to r. And otherwise, we'd have violation of uh, conservation of energy. So the total power of these waves must be equal to r, and so that means that the intensity of the waves, a distance r away from the point source, is equal to r over 4 pi r squared. And so what this means is that the intensity falls off with distance from the source. So if this is distance from the source, this is the intensity. The intensity will fall off as a function of 1 over r squared. Right? So this is you know, proportional to 1 over r squared. So here we are seeing that conservation of energy means that the intensity of waves propagating in three dimensions must decrease as they move away from our point source. So we've now got an expression for how the intensity of a wave changes with distance from the source. And that change in intensity comes about because of a fundamental principle of physics, conservation of energy. So that's how a three-dimensional wave spreads out in a sphere. But what happens if we're looking at a two-dimensional wave that's constrained to the surface of a solid or a liquid? So to look at that, we'll go back to our computer screen and have a look in detail at how we define wave intensity for a two-dimensional wave and what that means for how the intensity changes with distance from the source. Supposing now, though, we consider surface waves. So these are not going to be acoustic waves now. We're, we're talking about something a little bit different just to finish off this uh, video. 
So for surface waves, we have them propagate on a two-dimensional surface. So they do not spread out in three dimensions. So our intensity now is going to be the power per length. It's not no longer a power per area because the wave front is going to be a line, right? So we have a wave front that is a line, not an area. And so our intensity is a power per unit length, and so this will be watts per meter. So if we make the same argument that we did for our three-dimensional acoustic wave here, then what we have is we have the intensity of this wave multiplied by the length of the wave front, where this is 2 pi r, and these waves at this circumference here were all emitted from this point source at the same time. So if the point source has a power r, like we had before, then by conservation of energy, the intensity, which is the power per unit length, multiplied by the total length of the wave front, must be equal to r. And so that means that the intensity of the waves will be the um, total power of the source divided by 2 pi r. So for waves in two dimensions, you still have this fall off in intensity, but now the fall off is intensity is proportional to 1 over r, right? So here's, this is the intensity. So now we've got expressions for how the intensity of a wave changes with distance for the source, both for a two-dimensional wave that's constrained to be on a surface and a three-dimensional wave that can transmit itself through the bulk of a material. Now this is a fundamental property for all waves. Although we used in the three-dimensional case acoustic waves, it applies to all three-dimensional waves, including, for example, electromagnetic radiation, because it relies on this fundamental principle of conservation of energy that applies to everything. Now, this is where you can use this change in intensity for amazing calculations. One of the earliest of these was done by a physicist named Herschel, and what he used was he used a tin can of water and a thermometer, and he measured the intensity of radiation coming from the sun. Having calculated the intensity of radiation coming from the sun at the Earth, that allowed him to calculate the entire power output of the sun. So with a can and a thermometer, he ma a can of water and a thermometer, he calculated the power output of a star, which is pretty amazing if you think about it. So that's it for wave intensity. The next topic we're going to look at is what happens when waves interact. 